Hello and welcome and we're here in Carrigadrohud for a very interesting heritage evening. This is Heritage Week and this is actually the 19th of August 2013. Now tonight we're going to take you on a journey through Carrigadrohud homes and buildings past and present. This was an idea of Carrigadrohud Tidy Towns Committee and here to tell you how it all came about is Chrissy O'Donoghue, the chairperson. Now Chrissy, tell us all about it. Um, a few months back, um, one of our local committee, Anne McCarthy, decided it would be lovely to do something for the village of Carrigadrohud. So they decided they would call it Carrigadrohud, um, lovely Carrig long ago. So that's so we started to do our work and it all came together after a lot of hard work. And you see, what you see here tonight is a result of many months of hard work and research on the part of our voluntary committee members. We've done our best to ensure that all details are as accurate as possible, but in the event that we've forgotten anything wrong, I'd apologize now. Indeed, if anyone here tonight has amendments or further information for us, we'd be absolutely delighted if you could pass it on. This has been a labour of love for all of us, and we're hoping to keep some kind of permanent record of our works after tonight is over. Naturally, it would be marvellous if this account is as accurate and detailed as we can. Now, the route you should follow is laid out on the maps provided and there will be members of the committee at different points to help you out if needed. All that remains for me to do is thank you again for coming and extend an invitation to everyone to finish their journey in the Carrigan where there will be refreshments. And I wish you all an enjoyable stroll down memory lane, lovely Carrig long ago. Now, anyone that would have family members abroad and away there's all these plaques are going up on the website, Carrigadrohid website, for anyone that wants to go into it and have a lovely evening and enjoy yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chrissy. Now you have a great introduction to everything that's going to happen this evening. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take you on a journey and we're going to start at number one, uh, which is the Lakeside Inn. So if you can come with us uh, for a moment. Oh, you're looking gorgeous. This is number one, is it down here? Yeah. Well, here we are now at number one, which is the Lakeside Inn. And this building now will be described to you by Anne McCarthy, known to a lot of us in Carrigadrohud as Anne Tuhi. Anne, can I interrupt you for a moment, please? Can you tell us all about this building, Anne? You'll have to take the microphone though. If you want to come over here now, you can follow me here. It was at one point, it's known as the Lakeside Inn. And in 1875, it belonged to a Jeremiah Cal. In 1884, 1891, a Daniel Cal was there. And according to the 1901 census, it was Daniel and Mary Cal. And the owner in 1907 was M.E. Cal. The 1911 census was Hannah Cal and 1914 and 1921, Hannah with her husband John, and they are here in this photograph. Hannah was later to marry a John O'Sullivan from Peak in Dripsy, and she lived, she moved from here and went to live in Peak House. In 1930, approximately, the ownership changed to Nora Keneally, and in Keneally's time, the pub sign was T. Keneally and the Castle Bar, and you note the sign here was T. Keneally. In 1935, her brother Ty took over and ran the pub with his wife Mary until 1957 when it was bought by Hogan's, who owned the pub across the road. And after the business closed, it was occupied by Tim O'Driscoll and family from 1959 to 1974. Thank you. Moving right along here to our next place, which is Molly Cahill's shop. Now, it doesn't look too much like a shop today, but we'll find out a little bit more about this in a few minutes when we get back to Chrissy, who is going to inform us all about Molly Cahill's shop. Chrissy, tell us all about it. Um, Molly Cahill was in here. It was a John O'Donoghue that owned it first, and then he ran it here with his wife. Um, let's go up here now to this. He ran it here with his wife, Margaret, 
and they ran they owned it until 1921 and later Molly Cal was mar Molly Raren was married to Tim Cal and they ran the business until they closed in 1950 so it has been closed and ruined and we have done it all up and and it is lovely yeah Thank you, Chrissy. Actually, we'll pop back here for a second because there's a very distinguished Canterbury man down here by the name of JJ Hinchin, and we might have a fast word with him. <laughs> Gentlemen, we're going to interrupt you a few minutes there. We just want to say welcome to JJ. Back to Carrigadrahood this evening. So, you're very welcome. So, hum, what kind of changes have you seen through the years here, JJ? Tell us. Well, it was the places are getting brighter, right? Like, but. There's no change in the houses, they're all the same. And there's very few new houses built. So what's your greatest memory of the early days in Carrigadrahood? There was I used to deliver we used to deliver the milk here a gallon of milk to Nora Canelli. And at Christmas she gave us uh, she gave us uh, to the, uh, to the uh, a chocolate just twenty four squares. We'll get we'll get that at Christmas. Very nice. That was just a little gift, is it? Huh? That was a, a gift. gift for bringing down the milk. And was there in, in the... Nora was there. Yeah. And there was, was there always a pub across the road? We didn't get to that building yet. There was. Always. Always. Memory. Some were there and then, of course, with this Hogan's bought, Mrs. Hogan, Pat bought, well, Mrs. Hogan, uh, bought the license and she transferred it down to Dripsy. You know, what's the other place there? The of course, your biggest memories of course, just the three, is it? Most of your uh, memories, of course, would be the GAA with Kennedy. Oh, there would be, dear. That's not a night. It isn't a night for the GAA yet. JJ, thanks for talking to us. Not at all. To be here. So now we're going to move on to number three, which is Nora Lucy's shop. I don't think there was any young person in Kennedy wouldn't remember Nora Lucy's shop because um, it was always the hanging out place, sitting on the steps of Nora Lucy's shop, was what everybody's dream. Now here it is, and there are the steps that, and of course the cock examiner was on sale here. And if you look at the window here, you will see some of the, the old uh, scales and vim for cleaning. And I don't know who's you talking to us. Rita O'Brien is going to have a word with us about this building. Nora Lucy uh, had a grocery shop here, and of course, it was a mandatory stop because the examiner was on sale here for all those years. And um, there was a shop here in 1884, continued on under a K. Mac Sweeney in 1907. And that lady was married to a man named Sullivan. He owned two pubs as well as the shop, one in Bailnamarov and one in Peak. There was also a tailor here, Patrick McSweeney was the tailor. And these McSweeney's were ancestors of Dermot O'Donovan Coachford. Nora Lucy ran that shop from about 1930 to 85, 1985. They came from Bantry and her father Danny lived with her. She had a brother John and a sister Catherine who married Timothy Foley in Coachford. Um, there are some photographs there on the charts with regard to um, patrons and uh, there's one uh, there's one newsstand which reads terms of plan to meet Hitler's claims so uh, it's historic in its own way and we're here now at Nora Lucy's shop again and I'm joined here by Patsy actually he told me he's Max Whiney but we have it down on the records here as Max Sweeney, so I stand to be correct in that so, Patsy, you're very welcome back here tonight on this nostalgic night. Uh, how do you feel about being back in Carrie Goodrahat? Thanks, thanks very much for the welcome. And I would like to pay my compliments to the committee for organising, organising such a wonderful event. I am very proud of my ancestors and it is wonderful to be able to trace back well, their origins. And um, it's a most beautiful village. And it's very interesting, you know, it was a hub of activity. Um, and and how long ago was it since you were here last? Oh my God, I was, I passed through it a number of, on a number of occasions, maybe on my way to McCroom or visiting my parents and grandparents in the graveyard in Ahina. 
But other than that, I didn't really know much about the place um, because my dad's father died when he was quite young, so my dad didn't really have a lot of information. About you might explain to us your relationship to the building behind us. Oh, my granddad, uh, um, he lived there, I believe, and he was involved in the tailoring business as well as um, having a shop. And I think his wife was also um, involved in dressmaking. And um, he was associated with a few pubs as well as, I, can, I don't know whether he was a drinking man or not. But um, there is a photograph of him there. And he seemed to be quite a tall man. And it's really very interesting and it is great to be able to look back on history. It's so important to know one's roots and I'm very proud of them. Well, I suppose like, like Patsy, there'll be a lot of people getting back to us about some things that were left out during the programme this evening. Uh, things they might add, but it all, it's all will be put into history anyway. So thanks, Patsy, and we'll continue our journey. Thanks very much for the invitation. Now it was really wonderful meeting you, and thank you all to the locals and for their wonderful organisation in getting this event together. Now it's really a wonderful patchwork of the past. So thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Patsy. Rita, Rita's coming with us on the way, and we're approaching here nearly to me. Um, house but of course what it, we're interested here tonight is uh, the forge so we have people in action here demonstrating by the way a lot of the costuming tonight was all designed by Rita as usual she's no stranger to costuming so here we are with the boys walking very hard Rita can you tell us something about the forge well this is the forge as it is today and the chimney at the, re the gable end there was the the chimney of the forge and uh, there's a photograph there on the chart of Dixon Toomey uh, showing a horse that would be Liam's grandfather and this gentleman's great-grandfather and an Alfred Keegan ran a forge business here in 1886 in 1907 this premises was occupied by Dennis and Mary Regan Dennis was also a blacksmith and then in 1920 Dixon Richard Toomey took it over and ran a very successful forge. And his son Neely lived there all his life with his wife Anne and family. And uh, the gentlemen are plying the trade of old. Uh, this song must have been reverberating around the village every day for many, many a year. Thanks once again, Rita. So we're moving right along. Thank you, gentlemen, for all the hard work. And we're moving around the village here now, and I should know about this house because this is where I spent most of my time when we moved as a family from McCroom. We moved here to what was known as Castle Cottage. So uh, in a moment, uh, I'll get Rita to talk to you about this as well. And then we'll take a walk in around the back and see the buildings in the back of, of the house. So uh, I'll hand you over now to Rita and we'll walk along as we keep speaking to you. This house was known as Swiss Cottage as well. In 1875 it was occupied by Reverend P.A. Pope, parish priest of Vihina. It was occupied in 84 by Lieutenant General Bird and the name of the house at that time was The Castle. According to the records, the house was owned in 1907 by a Mrs. Carter. In 1914 it was owned by a Miss Mary Dowden and in 1921 it was occupied by Mr Heap. Then Julia Mary O'Sullivan, Nee Cahill, ran a very successful guest house there in the 40s and 50s. It was known as Mrs Dens. Also at this time there was a tennis court in the garden. In 1965 the house was purchased by John and Judy Ring, who also ran a guest house and catered for travelling and local shows. It is believed that it has been built on the former barn of the castle. And there are a century perhaps between the front portion of the house and the rear. And uh, there's a very nice photograph on this uh, placard here of uh, Julia Mary O'Sullivan, who would be Don O'Sullivan's, um, uh, he's a veterinary surgeon now, he lives in Forest, his grandmother. 
Now we'd move along here. I'll give you a little bit more information because seeing as I was living in the house, I should know. And I will just give you an idea where the tennis court was. And then we'll go around the back to see the buildings as well. I, I believe that um, at one stage there was another small dwelling house at the back. So now uh, we're moving in and just on my right... Down here on my right, if uh, you can see the green, that's where the tennis court was. And as you can see, the River Lee runs nicely along there to make it very picturesque and plenty of greens as well. I'd say definitely 40 shades of green. So we'll move in along here and you can have it, the balcony you see here actually in the old days was around all of the house. We saw that in some old photographs recently and that balcony was uh, went right around the house which was very unique I suppose at the time. So uh, we're going in here now to the yard and there is a very very nice view uh, in the garden going right down um, down the river and I suppose down towards eventually in Ascara and in Ascara Dam. So I'll just take you on a little trip in along here. And I think on the left hand side here, that building I think was in fact a little dwelling house long ago. And as you can see, there is uh, a beautiful Carrigadrohud view here, right down. But of course, it is a beautiful, fine evening as well, and everything is very calm. Now, we have a very special person here to speak with because anyone that has ever heard about Carrigadrohud will have heard about, of course, the dreadful, dreadful occurrence there where Bishop McEgan was hung many years ago. Now, we have somebody here to talk about that, and that's the bishop himself. So, now, are you going to tell us all about it? You poor man. Good evening uh, on this auspicious occasion. I think it would be nice just to give a brief story the life of Bishop McEgan. Bishop McEgan, as far as we know, was born in the year 1600 in Duhello. Now, we have no, uh, we have no further information on that, only that it was in Duhello. And at a very young age, he was sent to Spain where he was educated and came back in the early 30s as a priest. And he immediately got very active in the history of Ireland. And as an active person, uh, it, it could be said of him that in that short time from the... Uh, from say the mid 30s or the early 30s by, by from 1630 mid 30s to 1641 he became the guardian of the Franciscan Friary of Butterman which was one of the biggest positions you could have in the church. Uh, from there he was so good at what he was doing organizing the Irish chieftains and that as well as his ecclesiastical duties he was appointed and uh, <clears throat> I suppose and you could say the agreement of uh, Owen Row O'Neill of Ulster and he was appointed Chaplain General of the Ulster Forces and that was under Owen Row O'Neill himself and was there from 1644, a very short period before his death in 1650 that he really had the most wonderful successes. He was, he was in attendance on the 5th of June, 1646, he was in attendance at the Battle of Benburb. The Battle of Benburb was surely one of the most successful uh, battles in Irish history of that time because it was the first time for many years that the northern chieftains had stood together and that was under the auspices of our bishop. Now, from there, after just in two short years' time, he was consecrated the Bishop of Ross in 1648 in Waterford. The same day there was a Robert Barry was consecrated Bishop of Cork. Uh, did I say Cork already? It was Bishop of Ross, of course, he was appointed. And Robert Barry was consecrated a Bishop of, of Cork. Uh, now, everything was going well 
but of course it was going too well for the British. And on the 15th of August of all days, 1649, Cromwell landed in Dublin. From there the history is often told on television and radio about the slaughter of Drogheda, Wexford. He failed slightly, Cromwell failed slightly at New Ross. He came to Waterford but he didn't spend any time trying to conquer it because that was a big fortress. And he spent the winter in Yall. And while there, our brave Bishop McEgan had heard of Lord Roach's son and Lord Roach himself in Kerry putting an army together and they wanted to take McCroom. Uh, Bishop McGeegan joined him immediately and in a very short time they had up to 5,000 soldiers gathered together but they weren't soldiers, they were young raw recruits and young men from Kerry and while they had the numbers and they marched to McCroom Cromwell had got word of it and with fi about 1,500 they ambushed them about four miles outside McCroom and Cromwell's men won the day. Cromwell wasn't there himself, a Lord Brohill, a very uh, severe, cruel man. So uh, they killed about 700 of the Irish and they took 20 prisoners and in those 20 prisoners was the Bishop McEgan. Bishop McEgan, they recognised them and they immediately came to the conclusion that this was the way to capture Carrigadrohut Castle because they had passed it on the way to McCroom and they thought it was a big fortress, which it is and was. So uh, having done that, they came, they, they marched, he didn't promise anything, but they marched them out with uh, roughly uh, 200 foot soldiers and 70 horse, uh, horse soldiers. And uh, the road that time from, from McCroom to Carragher, strangely enough, was over the top of the hill through Mushra, or through Umrah. Yeah. And it came all down just south of Rasheen, and they came down the hill on the, western, on the eastern side of Carragher Road. And when they got within earshot of the castle, they asked Bishop McEgan to uh, tell the troops in, in, in Carragher Road Castle to surrender. But because on the journey from McCroom to Carrigadrohud, he'd seen so much slaughter by the British troops. They killed men, women and children as they came on them. He said there was no point whatsoever because they'd be all murdered anyway. So he told them to fight for country and spirit. And they immediately hung him on a tree right here behind us. They, they, apparently he wasn't hanging long. He, kept, he was brought down and beheaded in front of the troops. And soon after, the, the troops in the Carry Castle surrendered. And that is the story of Bishop McEgan, as I know. We have plenty of information there on Bishop McEgan. So thank you very much, Pat. And uh, tonight, of course, you are in your Bishop Garb. Yeah. Now, we are approaching a very historic house again all in Carrigadrohut of course and this house of course is known as Kilinardrish House you can come with me now and you will see here we have an enactment of I suppose a ladies tea tea afternoon uh, as well as a trap that would have been used uh, this is all very nicely um, costumed and I'm going to hand you over again once again now to Rita and she'll give you a brief summary of details of Kilinardish House. Now, uh, the Topographical Dictionary of Ireland in 1837 states that an elegant Italian lodge was lately built by Robert J. O'Donoghue of the Glens. And in the 1901 and 1911 census, it was owned by Miss Elizabeth O'Donoghue and her sister Anne lived with her. They remained there until 1938. When the RIC barracks were burnt in Killinardrish, the house was occupied by the RIC and Black and Tans for a few years, and she moved temporarily to Rockbridge Cottage. Then it was bought on her death by local farmer Dennis Lenehan, and uh, a member of the Rye family from Rye Court was the next occupant. Colonel Herbert and Miss Lillian Herbert owned the house for some time, and then in 1961, Werner Lorel bought the house and soon after it was occupied by her sister Mrs. Gisela Bardoff and her son Felix. 
They lived there for about 19 years, and the present owner is Werner's son Peter, with his wife Belinda and family. And prior to the present Kilinardrich house, another house of this name was situated on a farm adjoining the village. Only the site and landscaping remained in 1800. The dwelling house on that farm was known as the Stewart's House on the Griffiths Valuation and was occupied by Thomas E. Crook. The landlord was Sir Augustus Warren. And uh, there was a relationship then. He was a brother of Anne, um, wife of Robert J. O'Donoghue, Killinardish House, and it was known that he was involved in the founding of the actual village of Killinardish. And uh, they had a, the O'Donoghues had a brother, Richard, who emigrated to Canada. Now, um, that's giving you a brief outline of Killinardish House, but we're going to move up along here now to the gardens where you will see a little game of tennis going on uh, maybe similar to the way it used to in those days so you might get a glimpse there of the young ladies and ladies let you enjoy your afternoon tea No mini skirts those days, I'd say. It's supposed to be an amazing thing, and a night like this is the evening like this because the weather is so fine and everything. It's so wonderful to see the lovely colours, the landscape, and the gardens. Um, I suppose when you believe in Carrigadrogha, not always would you get the opportunity to take the, the time and admire the gardens and the greenery. Uh, so we have that opportunity this evening, and. I hope you're enjoying it as much as we are. Now just behind me is the next building and this would have been known of course as Nell Dinans. So we're going to approach that now and once again Rita will fill us in with a bit of the history of this little cottage. Here we have a cart and of course the old bastables are here on display as well. And we have something very interesting here for people that are, well I suppose there's different names. There's in the old days they were called seamstresses I think. Um, dressmakers so we'll take a close look here at what's happening uh, with this sewing machine in action uh, this is a very old machine so you can see they're getting going in action with the footwork and all you see very interesting so now I'm going to ask uh, Rita have a word with us about this building while you're observing the machine in operation here and Mary Harrington operating it. This is Dynan's house. Jerry Dynan, born in 1848, worked as a land steward for Bessie O'Donoghue at Killinardish House. He married Honora Scannell from Kilbritton. They had 12 children, seven emigrated to America. The last occupant of this house was Ellie, Nell Dynan, whose occupation was a seamstress. Now she'd be Mary's aunt, and she died in 1968. Mary Kate Harrington, Nee Dynan, was a daughter of Jeremiah Dynan, postman, brother of Nell. Prior to Dynan's, Morris Bland lived here and had a forge at the top of this hill. The Dynan family have resided in the area for several generations. It is widely held that two Dynan men and two O'Leary men secreted the remains of Bishop MacEgan, who was uh, hanged in Carrigadrohid. Uh, they secreted it in the nearby Kilcowlock, the burial ground opposite Canavy Church. And after a few nights, when it became safer to do so, the body was removed across the River Lee and interred in a Hena graveyard. Lynch, in his History of the Irish Bishop, tells, and there is a local tradition to the same effect, that though the night was dark and cloudy, a mysterious light guided the little funeral party to the place of burial.
Thank you, Rita. Now that that's very interesting. So we're going to move on now, and we're going to show you uh, Carrigadrohad lovely grotto. Okay. Now we are uh, approaching Carrigadrohad grotto, and this is uh, this has always been very well kept, and of course, in particular now since uh, the tidy towns started uh, a few years ago. Um, we're very proud of it here in Carrigadrohad. And now we're moving on to what was known as Kilinardrish Post Office. And Rita again will we'll fill you in on the information and the history of Kilinardrish Post Office. Now as we're speaking, an historic photograph is being taken of the Kylie family who were um, in this building for a number of years. Uh, in 1934, actually, Patrick Kiley was uh, an occupant, occupant and uh, he was a boot and shoemaker while his wife ran the shop. They had eight children, and you can see perhaps maybe five of them here tonight at the door of the post office. And uh, they left the area in May 1973, and the shop then closed, and the post office was relocated to Carrigadrohid Village. It was then bought by Dan Murphy. And from 1875, uh, there was a post office here. And the people's names were McDonald's. Then there was a Morris Connery. Ma uh, Judy McDonald married him. It was known as Connery's Post Office. And they had one son, Mossy, who was a hackney driver. And uh, 1907, and uh, Mrs. Connery, grocer and stationer. 1921, Babe Ryan, niece of Mrs. Connery. And... From 1934 to 1973, the Kylie family, whom you see in before you now. Thank you, Rita. And it is wonderful, of course, to see all the Kylies back in front of their old home. Now we're going to be moving right along here. And we're going to be going to what the hill is called after, the RIC Barrack. Hey. You're taking pictures of barracks? This building barracks, was the RIC barracks in the early part of the last century. It's against the law. Take pictures of a military or priest barracks. State your name and state your business. Yeah, my name is Rita O'Brien and my business is videoing you tonight <laughs> in this wonderful reenactment of the history of this illustrious Brian, building. Know, you know this, but the situation is a condition of martial law and war exists in Ireland. This building has been attacked by rebels. There's rebels down that town. I would advise you to go very carefully. There's armed rebels down that town and their intention is to do harm to the king's property and the king's men. I would advise you and your people to come up to this notice with the sergeant. A proclamation from McCroom Castle is about to be read. Thank you. Constable, escort these people out. Yeah. Yes, Sarge. Have you got him? We want to. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. You know Liam Deasy, boy, do you? Do you know Tom Wales? Have you ever heard of Michael Collins? Hey? Have you seen Michael Collins? No. You're lying, I can see it. Don't like the look of him, Sarge. Don't like the look of him. You're a lucky boy. You're not in my picture gallery. Don't smile at the sergeant. Look straight ahead. Read that out loud, boy. Louder! Whereas foul murders of servants of the Crown have been carried out Listen, you look. by disaffected Listen. persons, and whereas such persons immediately before the murders appear to be peaceful and loyal people, but have produced pistols from their pockets. Therefore, it is ordered that all male inhabitants of Macomb and all males passing through Macomb shall not appear in public with their hands in their pockets. Yeah, that hands out of your pockets! Doing this order is liable to be shot at sight. By order, auxiliary division, voice, and intestine. Alright, last line again, boy. Read it loud and clear. Any male infringing this order is liable to be shot at sight. You people hear that? Hands in your pockets, you're liable to be shot in sight. Or else you'll be coming in for a talk with a sergeant here. I wouldn't guarantee you it's one talk you won't be coming out of. <laughs> now, boy, move along. While well, you have your teeth in your head. Keep going. Go Keep your hands out of your pockets. Oi, no two. Watch you want the machine gun. <laughs> Thank you, Rita. In early June 1920, the barracks was attacked by the local volunteers. Ten men entered the post office next door. 
They broke a hole in the roof of the post office and onto the roof of the barracks and with the aid of petrol and paraffin set it ablaze. The attack continued through the night until early morning. However, the RIC did not surrender. It is reputed that one of the constables played a fiddle at the door in the morning. The constables in the barracks had an escape route planned. From the gable end wall of the barracks, a hole was made through the wall of the adjoining house on the lower side, through the wardrobe, but this was never used. The site was bought and rebuilt by Jeremiah Dynan. Jeremiah's daughter, Mary Kate, started the glass house business at the age of 16. She later married Pat Har Harrington and they lived with their six children in the rebuilt barrack. Your uncle was there. We got your file inside, Mike. You can't lie to us. Let's see your hands. Let's see your hands. Come on, boy. Come around. I would need more than 10 shillings a day. Come over to London. Put up with this shit. Fellas like you, I'd be on ditches. Shoot me in the back as soon as I go. Dead go on. on. Dead on the village, shooting. <laughs> well, if there's anyone going to still shooting around here, mate, it's going to be us. You tell those boys. If they're looking for a fight, they're going to come here. We'll come down, down in the wild and we'll give them a fight, boy. Uh. Now our next stop here is a little cottage and we would all know it in Carrigadrohud as Mrs Horrigan's. So to tell you a little bit about Mrs Horrigan's, I'm going to hand you over to Rita once again. But if you take a little look at the laundry out on the line, it's quite interesting. And you have a little old time washing machine. Or no, it's actually, I think, a ringer. It's actually a ringer, I think. And there's a washboard there as well, and the table and chairs. So now Rita's going to tell you a little bit about uh, this building. No, that, building actu that building actually is Mick Lynch's. Um, and uh, John and Mary Lynch lived here and reared a family of three. Two boys and one girl. Mrs Lynch, known as Barney, was a cook in Killinardish House. John Lynch also worked in Killinardish House. Their sons, Denny and Connie, worked for local farmers. Sorry, and they had a third son, Mickey, who was the postman. He was secretary of Canavy GA from 1950 to 58 and 65 to 68. Their daughter, Katie Maloney, moved to Ardmore and reared a family of nine children. Now the house at the extended barracks there is actually Mrs. Horgan's, and the owners were uh, Thomas Welsh, an RIC constable, and his wife, Bridget. And John and Julia Creedon lived there. James Hurley and sons, Michael and Patrick. Michael was known as Mick the Taylor, William Scannell, Mrs. Longbarry Lynch, daughter Kate Long sold the house to Noni Shine, Bill and Molly Horgan, Margaret O'Reardon, Evelyn Moore from Orne Abbey, Paddy Lehan, and that is really, that house has been replaced by a, a sunroom. Now we're moving right along here, and the next house we have in front of us is uh, Hurley his house. So uh, briefly, Rita will give you a little bit of background on this. In 1850, this house was known as Rock Bridge Cottage. It was occupied in 1886 by a Mrs. Dora Brown. In 1941, it was known as Rock Cottage, and Mrs. Janet Harding lived there. The owners were Mr. and Mrs. Pat Kelleher in 1952, and Mrs. Kelleher's sister, Mrs. Warren, resided with them. She was an aunt of Eddie Warren McCroom and uh, Dr. Mert Keller, a brother of Pat, had a practice in McCroom. Later in the 1960s, the house was owned by a Mr. Charles Joseph Adderley. Derry Hurley he purchased, it, purchased it in 1966. He carried out major renovations and added a second story. Now the next house we are approaching here, this little pretty cottage on the left with the bicycle outside the door. This is the house of uh, the late Dennis O'Reardon. Uh, this was the O'Reardon family. And actually beside it, where you see the cart, that is actually the site of another house, which was uh, the property of Ger Lines. Now, Rita might be able to tell us a little bit about that. Also, Rita, we'll go straight into, because it's within our view, we'll go straight into the gate lodge. So the three uh, of these, historic pieces will um they're so near each other we might as well deal with the three together right dennis o'reardon's 
Um, this is the house where Mocky, as we knew him, and uh, his sisters Nora and Catherine and their parents Paddy and Julia lived. And uh, Paddy worked at Cahill's, Julia worked at Lehan's, Nora worked at Kelleher's, Catherine worked at Lady de Wirt's, and Dennis worked at O'Regan's. Now the vacant site here. Is the Gerline site. First no owner was Margaret Murphy, Jeremiah and Hannah Dynan and family lived there from 1914 to 23. <coughs> Jeremiah and Hannah Dynan and family lived there from 1914 to 1923. Jer and Nell Lyons from 32 to 39. Jimmy and Madge Creedon from 39 to 50. And no one has lived there since. Now the gate le lodge is number 17, is down close by. Kilinarger's house, ha house had a gate lodge in New York. Kilinarger's house had a gate lodge in Neo Tudor style. Molly Connors and two brothers lived there, Monty O'Sullivan, uh, Billy Coleman and family, Loonies, Liam and Nora Lyons, Chaz and Valerie, Valerie Senior, Sharon Manning and Michael Hargreaves was the last occupant. Now I'm going to hand you over uh, to Teresa Mathers, who is going to talk to you about Carrigadrahad Castle. She's beautiful costume, and she's going to have a word with you. Teresa, you will tell the viewers all about Carrigadrahad Castle. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, and welcome to my castle. This is a McCarthy castle, uh, built by the McCarthys uh, back in 1455. Um, I suppose you can see my pot of gold here. The origin of the castle is believed, or at least a folklore tale has it, that it was a leprechaun that supplied the money in which the, with which the, the castle was built. But, of course, I'm sure that's only a, a fairy tale, really. It really was a McCarthy castle. It is a, uh, it is a tower house. And a tower house means that it is rectangular in shape. It is an original dwelling house. It would be a garrison. It would be a fortified dwelling, I suppose. And on the other side, you can see when you pass by, you will see that it is extended eastwards and northwards. This particular castle has seen a whole pile of changes, facelifts over the years. It has seen battle. It has seen different occupants. Um, the O'Leary's, of course, were, or the McCarthy's, were the original uh, people who lived here. Uh, then it was followed by many of their tenants, including the O'Leary's and uh, Mrs. Joan Butler. Uh, following that, I suppose the last occupants here were in the early 1700s, and then it was confiscated by the Hollow Blade Sword Company, and eventually it was... Um, taken over by the Bones, who went on to live in Oak Grove, which is just uh, up river a little bit. Um, a very unusual house, a very unusual castle, in that it's only one of two which has been built um, on the river, uh, on a rock in the middle of the river. The other one is in Germany, it's on the River Rhine, and I suppose it's no wonder really that this would be a very strategic location uh, uh, to build a castle because of its position. It would be a fortified building on either side, you know, and it would be able to control much of the comings and goings and uh, they would be able to command a good view from everywhere. Um, the last occupants, as I said, were the O'Leary's, um, or the McCarthy's rather, in the early 1700s and 1703. And at the moment, the castle is in a poor state. 
even despite much efforts and local attempts in which to try and revive it and restore it and much money was spent trying to do that but unfortunately it has come to a standstill uh, recommendations were made by various companies to you know that would be safe and um, apply health and safety standards so you can see that there's a door which obviously is more modern but has been made to fit in with the castle um, there's warnings have been posted, masonry has been fixed and made safer, but I suppose there's still a lot to do. So we wait to see and we hope that somebody will come and maybe take it under its wing and one day it will be restored to its natural beauty. Thank you. <laughs> now we're moving on here um, to what some might consider in the, in the day the ballroom of romance which is Carrigadrahud platform. I'm sure there was many a match made, a lot of courting sessions, etc. Um, here in Carrigadrahud platform. This evening, we are very lucky to have Coltus playing and entertaining us for a while. It hasn't changed actually that much. Uh, the old stage that was there is still, is still there. I know my father played here on many an occasion and so did many more but uh, as you can see it was the place for the local hop my husband, oh, carry long ago. oh my heart is sad and weary in my dreams I see my Mary with her golden tresses flying and her cheeks are rosy glow in my joy I hear her singing with Bill Halifant's fiddle ringing as we danced the stack of barley in Oakery long ago. Busy. What's you got? What's you got, eh? What's you got? Just a jumper, sir. Just a jumper. How much? How much are you selling it for, mate? Uh, you rub it off someone, did you? Mother, you rub it off someone? It's my mother. I've learnt a long time ago never to believe you, even when you're talking. Okay, sir. All right, piss off. Okay, sir. Get out of here, go on. What's your job? What do you do? Postman, sir. Postman, yeah? Alright, where's the rest of them, mate? Where's the rest of them? My family. Speak up, you little got a snipe! Speak up! I didn't come over here from London for 10 shillings a day to buy. 